Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX, design, and product management professionals. My guest today is Koji Pereira. Koji is the host of the live podcast, Sales and Pixels, and has recently joined Twitter as a senior product design manager. There, he leads a talented team that is helping users to discover and find content and other people that they care about on the social network. Before Twitter, Koji was the head of design at Lyft Business, where he and his team of six designers covered seven product areas. While at Lyft, Koji's team launched a brand new product called Lyft Pass, which enabled companies to create their own ride programs. Winding the clock back a little further, Koji spent nearly a decade at Google, including roles as the head of design for Google's original social network, Orkut. Remember that? And head of design for Google's curator team, which included the design, launch, and growth of files by Google to over half a billion monthly active users. As a first generation Asian Latino immigrant with a Mira Indian heritage, Koji is particularly passionate about growing inclusive and diverse teams that have psychologically safe cultures. When he's not leading design teams, Koji can often be found volunteering his time for various well-known industry initiatives. He has been a design mentor for MIT's 100K Entrepreneurship competition, and also for Y Combinator. He's also currently a judge of the Technovation Challenge. With Koji having such an interesting origin story, which we'll get to soon, and a stellar career journey, I've been very much looking forward to today's conversation. Koji, welcome to the show. Brandon, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's great having you here, Koji. And I, as I mentioned before we started recording, there are some really interesting parallels between both of our backgrounds. And while this isn't a story about my background, it is something that I wanted to get into about your background and explore some of those things. I understand that you grew up as one of five children in a poor neighborhood in the city of Belo Horizonte, which is about 250 miles north of Rio for people wanting to place that geographically. Paint that picture for us. What was the neighborhood like? What did you see when you looked out of your bedroom window? Yeah, Brandon, thanks for asking that. Yeah, I grew up in this neighborhood where, you know, basically my mom was a visionary there because she was like, hey, I want to make sure that you have enough things to do at home so you don't get to play that much outside because if I played outside, I will be probably involved with things that wouldn't give me a very good future. My friends from the street that I lived in, they all got into trouble. They all got into some sort of like crime or drugs and things like that. So for me, using technology was a way to just like find entertainment inside my house. And I used to, you know, play video games, uh, got my first computer very early. My first computer was a apple II clone made in brazil and i had some people over just to like play games or show them like some of my codes uh small programs that i coded that would do some sort of like visual things on the screen so it was very fun and growing up in this environment for me was very interesting because i never expected to be very far from that reality so for me, being able to support my family or to be where I am right now was something that I really didn't even dream before. Like I was never really capable of dreaming this high, to be honest. Mm. And you mean, we've got a whole bunch of questions about your career journey because it really, as I mentioned in your introduction, has been has been quite stellar. But, I, you know, coming back to your neighborhood, I understand that for a, for a long while there, there wasn't even paved streets. 
Oh yeah, the street was uh, not paved at all, so a lot of dirt on the streets. And I used to study in a different neighborhood because my mom didn't want me to study in the neighborhood I was. So the school district was a uh, pretty violent and. Instead of that, I would get into like a school shuttle to another neighborhood and then study there. So for me, this was like the best that my mom could do uh, in terms of my education, in terms of my well-being, because then she knew that I would be safe. I would be able to focus on study and I would definitely have a potential different future than my friends had in the same street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard you describe what school was like before your mum moved you to the other district. And you said it wasn't uncommon for children to bring knives to school and to, for there to be fights almost every day. What was that like before you moved districts for you as such a, a young person growing up in what sounds like a very violent environment? Yeah, I like to joke that you know, I had many lives and, you know, my initial life was this one living in this neighborhood. I remember to see many fights. I remember to sometimes have to run because somebody's like, you know, into a fist fight with someone else or there's someone with a knife running around. And then like when I got to this school in a different district, to me it was almost like, oh, I'm joining a new world. You know, like everybody's different. I think the, on the other hand, I also noticed that they look at me in a different way too, because my mom had like a very old car, you know, I didn't have money to buy all the fancy stuff. So as a teenager, being this different school district was also kind of uh, put in a different bucket, if you can say that. And I, I saw myself differently too. And that kind of repeated in my life in different levels. Once I, you know, joined Google, for instance, that was the only company in my city that didn't have someone like looking in your shoulders to make sure that you're working well or that you're not like taking breaks too long to not work or anything like that. So a lot of micromanagement from that era. And then Likewise, when I moved to US, I was pretty much the only person I knew on the design field from Latin America. Then moving on to leadership, I'm still today, I know like maybe two or three other designers who are in the design leadership here that comes from uh, Brazil or Latin America. So there is not many of us representing uh, Latin America here. So to me, you know, it's almost like every time I have this pivot or this moment in my life, I'm kind of stepping in in a different world. And sometimes either I am the only person that is stepping in that world or uh, there is like few people that I can identify. And what is it about you, Koji, that has enabled you to swim rather than sink in those situations? It's a good question. I think I was always motivated to do 10 times better, you know, because I knew that for me to just to do the minimum, I would have to do like 10 times better than a regular person who had access to things. Because let's say if I do my work in the same level as someone who have already that position or that prestige or that uh, status of being the person who is supposed to be there, I wouldn't be noticed, right? Like, so I have to do 10 times better to someone come to me and say, oh, wow, Koji is really like shining here. You know, like he needs to be promoted or he needs to come to our company. And I, I just did that like tirelessly uh, across the years for that reason, because I felt like I needed to do, but also because I wanted to support my family um, and I want them to have the opportunities that I didn't have or many other people in the family didn't have. And I was the first one to go to university in my family to have a, a college degree. And for me, 
that really changed how I perceive the world. That also like open up a lot of opportunities for me. I know there's this big discussion today, like the designers need a degree or not. But for me, it was not much about the design degree. It was more about like having access to this new world that I mentioned before, right? Like just being able to connect with people who have different opportunities than you have so that those people actually enable you to see other landscapes that you didn't see before. So for me, being able to uh, go to college was this big experience of stepping in again in a different type of uh, landscape. And I supported another member of my family to do the same. I also get a degree. Uh, so right now there is three people in my family who are able to get a degree, which really, I think, changed for them too in a very positive way. Mm, 100%. And listening to you tell the story, Koji, it's clear that you're an incredibly resilient person. And I think if you want to look for amazing examples of resilience and also unconditional love, you often have to look no further than solo mothers. I understand your mum raised you on her own and she's been quite a inspiration in your life and she's always fought your corner. What lengths and why did she go to the links that she did to provide you with the opportunities that, that she has. Right. So, yeah, it's interesting. I feel like a uh, woman who have kids and are solo, they are the proof that the impossible can be possible, right? Like having a kid by yourself, just going through that pain and that like huge emotional hit that has on you. Plus, working at the same time, supporting your kid, giving your kid the access to education and shelter and food. This is almost impossible in my head. Like I can't even imagine me doing that at all. And to me, looking at my mom doing that, he's raising me and another, uh, uh, another siblings by herself was a big inspiration. And I definitely feel like I'm not even like close to what she could do by herself. She actually, she built a house by herself, like actually doing all the, you know, construction work with her own hands. She did the project herself. She, you know, did the architectural project, the engineering project by herself without any support. Of course, like everything's very informal and not very necessarily like academically correct but she was able to do it by herself, which is very impressive. And to me, I think it was like not only the biggest proof of love, but the biggest teaching to me over life, you know, like this is what I should try to do because I definitely don't feel I can do that level of work, but this is how amazing humans can be, and especially women in this case. And I definitely feel very, still very inspired by her. And there are so many, so many women that are raising their kids by themselves. And I just want to say, like, you're amazing. <laughs> it's definitely very impressive. And I wish that the world will be different and that women, women have the support of their, uh, you know, partners. But of course, like, this is a reality that, I still see happening in many, many families. So I think the flip side is that it just shows how strong women can be. And uh, in case of my mom, it's, it's very impressive. Yeah. And that's actually one of the parallels that we share is that solo mother and just the extreme resilience, love and strength that women like our mothers have had and just how deeply appreciative it seems like both of us are for the opportunities that they've given us. And it also sounds like you've really taken that on board and paid that forward into other members of your family to help, I suppose, elevate their opportunities in life to another level. And it all started with the hard work of your mum. We also share something else in common, and that is the absence of a father, as, as you could probably imagine from what we were just talking about. I understand that your mother has a Indian heritage and your father was Japanese, uh, but you only met him later in life for the first time in 2015. I understand that was when you could afford to, to actually book a flight over to Japan to see him. What was going through your mind when you were sitting on that plane on the way to Japan? 
Wow, thanks for the question, Brandon. You did your homework on research. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, I would love to hear your story, by the way. In my case, I grew up without the presence of a father, which, of course, when you're a kid, it's confusing. It's, you know, you have shame. You, you're not necessarily the most proud of it. You feel like, you know, you don't worth of love and that type of thing. But growing up to me was like, it's clear that my mom did a great job. Growing up even more, I was like, I'm actually grateful that I have only my mom <laughs> because I seen some fathers who are not great fathers at all. So maybe I'm, I'm lucky that I didn't have my father presence. So, you know, I started to get used to the fact that not all families are equal and that's okay. And when I was about to meet him, first of all, the goal was only to check the box, you know, like, yes, this person has my blood and I just want to know him in person, say hi and have a conversation, but not necessarily like open up the past and, you know, inquisitively ask about uh, things that are longer gone. So I met him and I was in an Airbnb. He got in the apartment and he just sat and we started to talk. And, you know, we didn't have, uh, I think he also didn't have the intent of like trying to rebuild the, the story or talk about the past. So instead we just started to talk about, you know, Tokyo and Japan and what are the things that he's up to, what his family is doing, how is his family is doing. And we took a walk together in Tokyo and he showed me a couple of places. So I really like look at this experience as if he was just like a nice person that I met and I was just to get to know more about him, but not necessarily someone that I needed to mandatorily have a relationship with because that's kind of us, and I, I didn't want to do that either. So, and it was very good and very nice for me to kind of like check the box and know that I met him and we had a conversation and were able to get along without necessarily, you know, keep rebuilding the past or reconstructing the stories uh, that happened years and years ago. So it sounds like you haven't maintained a relationship with him. Kind of. We still like have some chats on uh, WeChat that that's what he used in Japan, but it's very superficial in a weird way. It's like, hey, how are you doing? How's COVID, you know, in, in Japan? How's COVID in the US? But there's no real, like, strong connection as I have with my mom, for, for sure. Brendan, how, how is your story? I just like to hear at least, like, the basic notes about it, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So, so similar as in growing up for the, the most part into an adult before I I actually ran into somebody who ended up actually took someone out on a date and she ended up being best friends with my half sister, one of my half sisters that I had never met. Yeah. And we just pieced it together. So, I mean, it's a relatively small country. There's only 5 million people here. Um, so there's a bit of a joke that, you know, you better be careful because you might be related to, to somebody. So you ask a few questions and we, we, we put it together and it just unfolded after I, I think emotionally I had reached a point where I, I like you, had realized that my mum had done a fantastic job of raising me and enabling me to have the opportunities that I had. And I really put it, I put it behind me. I made my peace with the anger that I felt growing up uh, without a father. And it was really only about a month after that, that I met Charlotte, who was the person I mentioned who I took out on the date. And mm -hmm. after that, it was a cascade of events that eventually led to me sitting down opposite my dad, not too dissimilar to you at a, at a restaurant up here in Auckland in New Zealand. And I didn't have any expectations of him. And I like you, I wanted to check that box, I think in many ways to close the circle, uh, just to be able to, to look your maker in the eye. Yes. Um, and so I did that. And he was what I, he, I said, I didn't have any expectations. And I think that was probably a good way to go into it. But on the other hand, I feel like he was what I expected. I didn't expect anything would come from that. And it was pretty clear to me from that meeting that he didn't really have any intention of 
developing a relationship and neither did I want that from him. So we see each other, like, I mean, you talk to your dad on WeChat, we see each other at family events, but one of the, with my, with my half sisters, one of the great things that came from that for me is actually meeting my half sisters. And now I have, you know, nieces and nephews, and I have a great relationship with these wonderful women. So there was a silver lining there, but it's definitely a, a really formative experience. I think I was 25 at the time and I'm 30, wow. 37, 37, 36, 36 now. So yeah, that's my story. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Oh, all good. Yeah. Really was keen to explore that with you. I'm also keen to ask you about that. You know, you are from, from mixed heritage and while you don't necessarily have a, a deep connection with your father there, mm -hmm. what about your connection, uh, if any, with the country of Japan, the culture of Japan? Yeah, it's interesting. You may have heard that Brazil is very mixed. You know, my grandfather was black. My mom came from a indigenous family, uh, a tribe called Machacali in Brazil. That tribe was like completely destroyed. There's no history. There's no, there's not much things saved from like, you know, heritage on that tribe, which is very sad. Um, I still want to do some travel there just to like meet the less people who remain in that tribe. But anyways, it's, it's part of the history. And uh, my father's side, of course, like I went to Japan for the first time in 2015 and I met him, but my mom was always very appreciative of the Japanese culture. So we used to have like Japanese food during the weekends. I used to like a lot of like the Japanese culture when I was a kid, especially like I did karate, you know, all of those things. And my personality somehow was, you know, a mix of Japanese and Brazilian, even though I didn't have any contact with Japanese culture besides my mom and maybe like few friends. So I grew up with some sort of like Japanese culture in Brazil without any Japanese people around me, which, which is interesting to think about. Yeah, it's great to hear that your mum made an effort to connect you with that part of who you are um, mm -hmm. when you were growing up. Now, let's fast forward a few years. I understand that what you studied at university for your first degree was fine arts. And then after that, you went on to work for a startup, which you eventually became the CEO for. Mm -hmm. And then that startup was acquired by Dentsu. You then went on and did a master's of interaction design and applied for a role at Google. So I've just, I fast forwarded quite a bit there, but before, but before you got to Google, you said, before we get to Google, you said that you learned many hard lessons in that first role, that journey to becoming that CEO of that startup. What were they? Yeah, that's, that's a good story. I mentioned, I was always this mix of very into technology person, but I also had this very strong side of arts, you know, like drawing and projecting stuff. And then when I start to like study to go to university, because in Brazil, we had a test back then to get to uni public university. By the way, this university that I, I, I study was the one of the best universities in Brazil, very hard to get into. Not very well known outside Brazil, but for me, it was a big deal. And when I decided to apply, I told my mom, hey, I'm applying for fine arts. And she was like, <laughs> what? Fine arts? And I said, yes, mom, like, this is what I like. And then the next day she was like, you know, it's fine. You should do what you like and you should do what you believe on. I'm pretty sure like if you follow that dream, you're going to find something that's going to be great for you. And that stick in my head. And it was like, okay, this is a big responsibility. <laughs> you know, I have. That's also great something. parenting, right? Like that's brilliant parenting right there. It's brilliant. And she didn't learn from anyone. It's like, she just, she didn't have any formal education. She didn't really have any like supportive family behind her. She was just like, coming out of nothing, saying that to the kid, you know, the first one going to university. So she's really brilliant. And then I was like, okay, I'll do it. 
and I did fine arts, but I was already working as a graphic designer in parallel. And being a graphic designer, my first job was in a print studio. And in that print studio, my work was really mechanical. It was just like building logos for small businesses, like in every hour or so. Like I didn't have any time to do any more elaborate type of design work. So my 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 dream was to join an agency. But then the internet became a thing. And again, I was one the first person from my friends to have internet connection, dial up internet connection. Before that oh, I you would have been popular. I was popular. People used to go to my home just to like, you know, access NASA or NBA websites. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I wasn't to that before because I had a BBS, which it's a bulletin uh, board system uh, for those who are like not as old as me. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a basically internet for uh, MS DOS, right? Like the text only uh, connection, and then instead of connecting with everyone in the world, you just connect to a server and uh, via dial-up connection, and then you can exchange files and that type of thing. So I was already on into that. And when the internet became a thing in 1997, I had a band and I started to do like albums and posters for other bands too. And then I started to do websites. And I was like doing websites for maybe a year and a half or so. And then this company, at that time we didn't call it startup, but it was a mix of a startup and an agency because they had clients, but they also had three products. And the CEO at that time, he interviewed me and he asked like, hey, do you know how to use fireworks? And I said, yes. Do you know how to use Dreamweaver? I said, yes. But I never really use any of those tools because they were so expensive. And I learned in a week. I learned in a week and I <laughs> work in that company for a couple of years until a day that the CEO said like, hey, I'm leaving. I'm joining a telecom company. I have this amount of clients. I have four old uh, desktop computers. I have, you know, two or three products that we, we had on there. And he said, like, I can just pay you and you leave or you can just stick here and it's all yours i just transferred the company to your name and i said yes wow what a moment yeah i'm still his friend i was 21 years old i have no idea what it was to be an entrepreneur at that time and i said yes it was a big mistake in some ways because i had to survive with like ten dollars per month in some months but also was a big introduction to product design in a time that nobody really talked about product design. Uh, so one product that we had was a very primitive version of Uber Eats. So imagine again, desktop internet in 2000s, people would like take two minutes to turn on a computer, two minutes to connect to the internet, another two minutes to open a website. So we had a server connected to a facsimile. People would open this website, order a pizza, then we would have a, a software that would send a facsimile to the pizza place, deliver the pizza and get the money in cash. So we didn't have any billing transactions. Our business model was ads. So people could say, hey, I wanna be highlighted on your homepage. And then here's like a hundred bucks. So that was our product called Pedritudo at that time. And I had a lot of fun to be honest. So I didn't care that much about the money that I was not get, getting paid. But at some point, the company started to get bigger, especially on another product, SMS uh, news feeds. So we actually built SMS for a co- bunch of telecom companies. So you probably remember that. But once you buy a new phone at that time, you would get sign up for, I don't know, Horoscope or uh, World News. And that was a platform that we built in Brazil for this for the companies in Brazil. And there was just another second company that had that in our city. Um, so a bigger company acquired us, which later was acquired by Denso. So, and at that, that point it was like, okay, now I'm done here. And that's when I decided to leave and join Google. 
Yeah. So when you did join Google, I think initially you came on as a UX designer on the Orkut social network. And that project was eventually sunset in favor of Google+. Plus. Mm-hmm. What was it about Orkut that wasn't quite firing for Google? Why why did it get sunset? Yeah, I know this is a, a question that looks a bit obvious for people who even use Orkut at least once. Because if you open Orkut, let's say if Orkut was online today, you would have like tons of people millions of communities, you know, ads, and it was a fully functional product and quite successful. It was the biggest social network in Brazil, the biggest social network in India, which you think about now, like India is such a huge market. The problem was at that time, Google had this mentality of like, if I build a product, it needs to work for everyone in the world. And if it's not, if it's working only for a certain demography, I will shut it down, right? So that's pretty much what happened with Google Reader, which was a product that, you know, just like very tech savvy people would use. Um, I'm still sad so, about that. Yeah. I'm still sad so it's gone. <laughs> was killed for, by the same VP, by the way, who I worked with. Uh-huh. Uh, who, who is that person? Let's, let's find him. <laughs> uh, Vic, Vic Gundotra. So Vic was our VP for Google+. Plus. Um, I'm pretty sure he won't listen to this, so it doesn't matter anyways, <laughs> but he knows this too. He was you know, the person in charge at that time, and he said to us, like, hey, this doesn't make sense for us because it's so expensive to keep this product running, and it's just successful in Brazil and India. We want to build something called G+, Plus, who will be you know, for everyone. And the fact is, we learned later that it didn't end up as a success that they wish it was. So we actually sunsetted Orkut uh, and we lost like millions of users because uh, nobody wanted to migrate to G+. It sounds like the strategy at Google did change because near your end of your time at Google, I think the last three years or so, you became the head of design for the curator team, which was heavily involved in Google's next billion users initiative, which did center around those emerging economies of India and Brazil and possibly some more. And the idea there, I think you were leading a team of nine UXs across multiple continents was to develop a set of inclusive products for those markets. And that involved a lot of discovery before we get to discovery, just for the people that are listening that aren't familiar with Google's Next Billion User Initiative, what is that? Right. So that was very interesting because, you know, after G+, I did work in several other tentatives of social networks that didn't work very well. But I learned a couple of things on like, you know, lean a startup type of playbook and building something from scratch, zero to one, so on and so forth, a lot of discovery. And uh, someone from this team, Next Billion Users, reached out to me and he said to me, hey, we actually want to do the same thing that you tried before, the same playbook, but we want to build products for emerging markets. And that's what Next Billion Users means. They want to build products for uh, the next people who are not online yet. So there is like this statistic saying that more than a billion of people will still become online in the next few years, right? Like, of course, things just changed very quickly in the past five years, but still there is a lot of people to become online. And first, these people are very different from us, right? Like they don't have the metaphors that I grew up with, like desktops, icons and folders, uh, they are not necessarily uh, the people who have the same devices that I have. They don't have like fast phones and phones with a lot of storage. They don't have iPhones mostly. And um, they also come from different cultures. They also are using these phones and devices in contexts that maybe I'm not used to it. For instance, the fact that in India and Brazil, like the sun is always out and it's very hard to look at the, you know, the brightness of a cheap phone uh, in the outdoors. That's like a fact that nobody takes into account. The fact that most of the phones have screens cracked 
because people don't have money to replace those screens or not taking account. So when when he introduced the team, I was super excited because this is what I was doing when I was on Orkut. But now Google was really building this intentionally and they wanted us to actually come join and build something from scratch. What I was not super happy about was the fact that the VP on that team, they already had like some ideas on what to build. And we tested so many of those ideas. A lot of them didn't work. But in the process of research, we figured out all the problems. And then some of these problems became what files end up being. And one of the biggest things that we learned in this research was that it's, again, very obvious if you live in Brazil or India, but one third of the population run out of space in their phones every day meaning that there is nothing you can do in your phone because your phone is packed with memes or good more warning messages, right? Then there, you, basically your phone becomes very slow. And we knew, as a matter of fact, that people didn't have the resources to buy a new phone after that moment. So it's either we find something that will allow them to continue to use their phone in an optimal way or their phone will just get stuck. And we built this very simple prototype that would uh, pop in with a card saying, hey, here's your good morning messages. Do you want to delete them? And then if they said yes, they would go through a review screen where they could pick the specific files they want to delete. And after that process, they would save like 30% of storage. And then they could use again their phones normally as anyone would use. So this prototype was a success, like a tremendous success. After a week, 30% of people were coming back to it and using every day almost. Um, so we have very good signs of like, yes, this is the, you know, the direction we wanted to continue. And with that clear signal, we started to build files, which end up being leaked in the first version. I was very used to leaks at Google. Google is not very good at saving secrets. But usually the feedback from the media was always very negative. Hey, Google is trying this new thing again, which doesn't make any sense. But this one was like, finally, Google <laughs> built this thing that is fixing the main Android issue, which is a storage. So again, like we had research, we had data, we had media, we had everything in line to a point where we felt very confident about it. And there is a big element of chance. There's a big element of like having the right people in the right time, the right place. But I think one of the biggest source of the success of files to me was to being able to look outside the bubble, you know, and that the problem is not just in US, the problem is everywhere in the world. And there's too many people looking at US already. Like, how do you start to look outside? Mm, I wanted to ask you about that because problems, once they're solved, are often self-evident or obvious. People go, of course, that's a, that's a great product idea. But just how obvious was that when you first started? How did you actually stumble across the problem? That's the element of chance, I would say. Uh, with Next Billion Users, we had basically two arms. One arm was purely research with no necessarily any product goal, it was more like, let's understand how people use technology in India. Let's understand how people are getting introduced to smartphones in Indonesia. Let's uh, understand what the competitors are uh, building to, I don't know, what are the things that things people are building in Brazil uh, for Android phones, let's say. And then we had another arm, which was let's build new products, which was the team that I was on called Curator. So within these two teams, we had a lot of like cross-pollination. And when we're doing research, a lot of times, let's say we're t trying out this gaming platform idea. And, but we never ask questions like, hey, is, you know, like, we actually, we did have asked questions directly about the problem. Like, hey, do you play games? Do you have a console uh, that you play at home? Yes, we asked those type of questions too. But we also asked questions like, what do you like to do in your daily life? 
What's the main products that you use? What's your biggest pain when it comes to your phone? And with all of those broad questions, we figure out many other problems that we didn't necessarily thought about. It. You know, I really like the idea that you fall in love not with the solution, you fall in love with the problem. So we really spend a lot of time just understanding the problem and refining what type of problem we're trying to solve before we jump in and build that prototype that I mentioned. Mm. You also said in something that I was listening to that Google, even with all of its resources, couldn't fund you forever. And that was what made learning and learning quickly important. How did you know, particularly with files, because that's what most of our conversation at the moment is centering on, how did you know that you were onto something? Was there some sort of magic moment where the team just went, ah, that's it? Or was there something different? Was it more gradual? It was more gradual. I think uh, there was a lot of skepticism on, you know, if you have a fully staffed team who's super pumped about gaming platform, which was something we were building in the beginning, <laughs> you're gonna have some yeah. attrition, right? Like people will be there to be like, oh, I'm gonna work in this gaming platform for Google. And then in the middle of the process, like some engineers figure out, well, we're actually not building that anymore. We were building a file manager and some people were just like, no way, I'm not doing this. I'm leaving, you know? <laughs> so that happens yeah. and you have to convince people. You have to manage the tension and you have to keep the team lean, especially when you're like in the discovery phases, because if you just invest too much in the beginning, then, you know, you have way more friction. You have way more attrition. Uh, the other thing that, for me was very useful was to make sure that one we have the right problem and then once we start to work towards the solution i try to work with my team to make sure that the solutions we were building was also based on the profile of the users we we're talking to so for instance one example that i like to discuss is the fact that the file managers for android at that point they're mostly folder-based navigation, right? Like your, like your Windows or your Mac, Mac OS, when you go to your uh, file explorer, you have like this multiple tree level folders and you start to get in and multiple levels. And, you know, sometimes you lose your files, you don't remember where they are. Sometimes you create like categories that doesn't make sense. So I had a big conversation with my age team because I was like, I don't want to rebuild that experience for phones. People don't have this metaphor of organizing things in a tree uh, folder structure. And this is just a mess. It's not even a good solution in terms of design because it's too much confusion, too much control, and it depends too much in the user memory. So. I came back to the NH team and I said like, hey, let's try this tab and category based navigation where if you tap on images, we show on your images. If you tap on documents, we show all your documents. And if you wanna see all, you just stay on that first screen. But if you wanna see like from WhatsApp, from Twitter or from email, you start to swipe, right? Like, so using a lot of the natural gestures that people are used to, to do in phones. And in the beginning, they were like, no way, we can't break file structure on a phone because that's how files are physically attached to a device or a, or a storage in the phone. And I said, yes and no, because you know this is just a, an abstraction and we can just create another abstraction on top of that. But it was hard and, you know, we did a lot of research again to just show that, hey, this is working better. You know, let's try this. And I think my fallback, you know, trying to look at both points of view was to add an advanced mode where people could still access all the folder structure if they wanted. But guess what? Like most people didn't use it because it's so much easier to navigate towards your categories. So you actually put both of the modes into the product in order to assess quantitatively what would be more used. Yeah. So we put that and uh, the advanced mode is just something that some people still like it to use, you know, like especially the more tech savvy people. But again, if you think about the story I just told you on 
people who are having their first experience using a smartphone, it's way easier to take a picture or save a document. Just go to files and tap on documents and your document will be there. It will be the first in the list. You talked about confidence and bringing a new product to market seems to me at least to be in part about building confidence, you know, confidence that you've got the right problem, confidence that your solution is the right solution, confidence in the team in those things, but also confidence from senior leadership that when you're moving from prototype to product and about to launch something that it's actually worth the gamble, worth the risk. What were you doing? What kind of conversations were you having when you were at that point, whether it was go or no go, with your VP or the other senior leaders that were involved in the decision to actually bring files to market? Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be in a team where this was more like a shared experience, right? Like I, I didn't have to do a lot of those things by myself. And we also were very open about the idea that we're like research driven and we're data driven and if we disagree that's fine but we're gonna solve the disagreement by looking at data by looking at user feedback so and because we have very good researchers i would say that uh, you know aisha which was our researcher in india she was super strong and she was one of the persons who would just come back and present this report saying like hey this is what we're hearing from users. This is what they like. This is one of the things that are not working well. And that really made us confident, not just only the, the leadership, but the whole team confident that either we are in the right path or yes, we are in the right path, but there are some things we need to tackle. I want to come back to a scenario that I heard you describe about prototyping files earlier on. And I believe you're in a subway in Brazil and you were showing a participant an early prototype and you noticed that they were clicking on things really quickly. What was going on there for the participant? Yeah. So once I was in Brazil and I had a few people from with me um, from the product and edge team and we we're testing this prototype and we asked two people to just like use it and usually this type of research, we let the user just play a little bit and we observe them. We don't ask many questions or we don't give like a specific task. And we start to observe them and just ask them like, what are you doing here? Why are you clicking there? And this is a very common type of research. And they started to use our product in a way that they're just tapping on things very quickly. And I asked them like, hey, why are you just tap there? What happened? And he said, like, oh, I just like tap on the right side. And I asked, like, what was the question there? Because it seems like you didn't read because it was too fast. And he said, oh, let me take a look. And then he came back to the same screen and he looked at the screen and I asked him, like, what do you think this is telling you? And he said, like, I don't know. And I asked, like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, can you? tell me, can you read that to me? And he said, like, I can't read. I I can't, like, I'm illiterate. Like, I, I never learned how to read. And to me, that was, like, such an eye-opening experience because, you know, there's so many people in the world that maybe are in the same situation. And for the first time, as a designer, I was having a contact with this person. and And then he started to tell me, like, hey, I don't know how to read, but I look at the uh, UI and I look for visual clues that will tell me like, this is positive, this is negative. Is it, if it's on the right and it's color, probably it's a positive action. If it's on the left, it's probably negative. And I'll look for like icons. And sometimes I'll just like communicate with my friends using voice on WhatsApp because that's the, the only way I can communicate. I can read, I can type. So to me, that was like, you know, a big eye-opening moment where I felt like definitely there are so many things that we still need to solve in the tech world that many people are not paying attention to. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is huge. 
is actually huge. And, and it actually made me think a lot when I heard you tell that story, just about just how there are so many people around the world that are illiterate or struggle with literacy. And I, it really is probably one of the biggest elephants in the room in terms of design challenges for technology is how do we create a more inclusive set of products and te tech experiences for these people. I was speaking with another guest a few months ago called Whitney Quisenberry, and she runs the Center for Civic Design in the United States. And as part of her role, she's trying to help more people participate in democracy by making democracy more accessible. And something that came up in that conversation was even in the United States, only 13% of the population has a high proficiency in, in English as in university level, like we are talking now and like both mm -hmm. of us can read at with 43% of the US population basic or below basic proficiency. You know, so I, I just wonder like from your experience after that moment, how did that help shape how you approach the design of the product and the other products that you've worked on? Mm -hmm. I think there are two levels to this conversation. One is the more broad and like, yeah, just broad and personal level of things. And then the more tactical level, I'll start with the tactical because it's easier. In the tactical level, uh, the things that we started to work on the UI was, let's make sure we have visual elements in uh, combination with text. So when you have a button, there is a button that says cancel, but there's an X on the button if the button is on the right, then it's a positive thing. It's always positive and there is like a check mark on it. And also small things that we work with the material design from Google, the design system from Google on making sure that buttons always have some sort of like a visual affordance so they don't look like just plain links. So one of the things that we tested there was that people was, were overlooking the buttons without outlines. So we made sure that all buttons will have outlines, all buttons will have background. So that's more tactical and, you know, our design team worked on that. Uh, on the more broad level perspective, to me, I think it became very clear, you know, coming from Orca and working in several tentatives of social networks again, then coming back to MaxBeaming users that, one, you have to go deeper in humanity problems, right? Like you can't just look at the things that are not painful enough um, because there are so many products here in the US that are trying to give access to people who already have a lot of privileges, right? Like, and honestly, you know, it doesn't change that much because people have a lot of good access to things. If you look at people who are lacking privilege or they don't have access to things, then there's so many things you can improve. And yes, it is the right thing to do. It is a social good thing, but it's also it could be a good business in the case of files, for instance. These people, some people like will pay money for this. People will pay, you know, for a phone that is more accessible or for a device that can, you know, stay working for more than six months and they're just not having any, you know, escape hatch. Uh, on on their current experiences. So to me, I learned that building inclusive products are not just important, but it's good for business. And uh, in a sense, I also learned that the teams that I worked with, this team was one of the most successful ones because we had diverse people too. And each of the people in the team, they had firsthand experience in the past about like, an old phone or bad internet connection or, um, you know, growing up in a poor neighborhood like I did. So you, it's easier for you to understand how serious the pain is because it's not just about the problem being existent. It's also like how big the pain is for the people who are going through this terrible user experiences in their lives. Yeah, you have that first-hand experience of it yourself. And I want to come to diversity and technology in more detail with you in a second. But before we do that, I'm interested in how did you know you were done with Google 
you know, it's such a big company and it seems like there are so many amazing products that you could work on. I know you'd been there for, you know, almost a decade before you left, but why not just move to another team? Mm -hmm. Good question. So I never, Brandon, intentionally wanted to join a company for that long to start with. I never had a dream of like, oh yeah, I want to join a corporation and be there forever. That would be like almost the inverse that I wanted when I was finishing my degree. You know, I really wanted to just experiment and find new ways to build things and blah, blah, blah. The reason why I joined Google was because Google was really at front of everything that I liked and everything that I appreciated in technology. And it was true, like the time I spent there was amazing. But there's some facts. One, the company evolved and in in some ways beca- became more like a, you know, a big company, like other big companies. I also evolved there, like I changed over time. And for, I noticed that there's many other companies that I could join, especially here in California that would still have that feeling of the Google of the year 2008, the time that I joined. And and that's what I was looking for. I want to work in very scrappy teams who can build things quickly and can uh, be, you know, vulnerable on like, yes, we missed that, but we want to get better on that. And Google just became very solid and hard to, to see in that way. Not to say it's bad, I think it's great, but definitely didn't feel the right place for me at that point anymore. And when I joined Lyft, I learned a lot of things. The top thing that I was looking for when I left Google was a place where I could really take this idea of diversity and inclusivity and apply more broadly in the company. And when I joined Lyft, one of the first things that I did there was working with the diversity and inclusion team to think about, okay, how can we not only build a great product with a diverse team, but how can we actually be more uh, intentional when we build any team in a company? It starts with hiring, it starts with clear your plan, design pathways in our case, And one of the things that we were able to do together there was to think about like, okay, for you to become a senior designer, here are the bullet points you have to to do in your career plan, right? Like you have to be great on craft. You have to work well with your cross-functional partners. We'll also be able to include things like you have to listen to people. You have to make sure that you give space for others to express their point of views. You have to include people who are not designers in your design process, you know, and that to me was like, okay, now I can scale some of the things that I learned in that team to a broader group of people and broader group of uh, teams. And for sure, I could potentially do that at Google, but uh, the fact that things are way more solid there would be a way higher effort and probably a longer term type of effort, which at Lyft, I, you know, I stayed there for two, two years and were able to do some of these changes. Yeah. And I, I just want to give people some of your personal context because you speak so eloquently about this, you know, you're recognized in, in the industry as one of the leaders, particularly within the Latinx community for promoting diversity and inclusion. And you're very, very active in this, but I just want to bring people back to when you first moved to Mountain View in California in 2014, and you said, and I'm going to quote you now, I felt I wasn't the same person. I was in Brazil. Even my personality felt different and a new language. I was also stepping back some levels in my mind. I had 15 years of experience, but the US, uh, but in the US, it was like restarting from scratch. Yes. Why did it feel that way? You know, what was it about that shift from Brazil to to Mountain View that that made you feel like that? I think there is multiple things. Number one to me is the language, right? Like English is my second language. English is not something that we learn uh, in schools in Brazil in a very effective way. And even if you do free classes like I did outside school, 
they're not with like native speakers. And it's very hard to just like get better on English communication. I see many like Brazilian artists like Anita, for instance, a singer, she still struggles with English and she's like a, you know, international artist. She's like playing everywhere right now. And it's because in our formal education in Brazil, you don't get to learn English that much. So that's to me, number one. And there is two elements of the language to me. One is being able to articulate things in a way that you people can understand you. And then there is another level, which is like, you can articulate things in a way that you feel confident about it and you feel good about it. That's harder. And that's like a level where even today, maybe less, but I still don't think that in, I have the same level in Portuguese and English. So when I, uh, when I talk with other people, I see other Brazilians, I see that same struggle because sometimes they're like great designers and they can do a work that maybe some designers here can do, but they still struggle, struggle with the language. Then the second thing to me is just the fact that, you know, there is a lot of biases. There is a lot of like, there is a lack of representation in Latinx community in tech, right? Like the Latinx community in, in, in Silicon Valley, if I'm not wrong in the numbers, but it's about like 27% and there is like 3% in tech. Like in, in, in leadership, there is even less than that. So I really didn't, work with anybody on leadership and design they are either brazilians or or latinx so uh that's very hard and then people just don't get used to it people are not necessarily like they don't necessarily like think that you're smart enough because of your accent there is actually studies that tells that um so depending on the accent that you come from people have different biases there is also the fact that because when you come here, your resume is always like Brazilian companies or universities that people never heard of it here that they might have biases to. So my wife and I, for instance, we made sure that we did classes here. We study at, you know, extension classes at MIT or uh, Harvard, whatever, and Ber UC Berkeley in order to just like complement a little bit of our background because at least like you go to LinkedIn and you see something familiar and it's not like necessarily like something conscious that people do that because they're evil. It's just because we're not used to it. You know, like I know most of Brazilians I know here, most of the Latinx people I know here in the US, they're working in restaurants, they're driving like Uber or Lyft. So, uh, you know, people just don't, don't understand that when someone comes in design leadership or product leadership and have a background as the driver that that's okay you know and you touched on how you and your wife had taken classes at MIT and Harvard and, and other places to i suppose build a bridge between the the world that you left in Brazil and the new world and the new culture that you want to become part of in America and that's something that those types of behaviors you know learning the language going to the institutions of the country are, are quite well reflected across the world um, with migrant communities or migrant people coming to that new culture. I understand as part of this, you also took accent reduction classes. And this for me was fascinating. I'd never considered being a native English speaker, uh, although mm. I do speak uh, Kiwi English, which might be a bit hard from some, for some of our American friends to, to follow along, that you would actually go to such lengths to fit in. And then I thought about a, a friend of mine, Robbie Allen, who's also been on the podcast, and I'd heard him give a talk, and he's a Kiwi uh, European who speaks English natively. And he'd given a talk, I think it was to Mind the Product or some somewhere else like that, where he was putting on an American accent. And I that really, of course, I know how Robbie sounds normally, and that really <laughs> stood out for me. And yeah. so my question is, like, how do you walk the line as someone coming from one culture into another, like the United States, between fitting in and being who you are? You know, how far yeah. do you go to meet the dominant culture where it is? Mm -hmm. And how far should you expect the people within that culture 
to come to you? Yeah, it's difficult. It's troubling, to be honest. Um, you know, where are you talking? I just remember that movie, Sorry to Bother You, which the, there is like a character who's black and he's, he's selling stuff and he's just do this like white American accent. And people are just like more prone to buy things from him. Whereas if he uses his tone of voice normally, then people would just not buy things. So it, it's similar, right? Like if you think about it, the reason why we're doing this might not be okay. You know, it's not okay for sure, but we are surviving. So you have to sometimes do things that you don't feel like it's ideal, but it's part of the journey. So to me, I took it in a way that to me was not like, I don't want to lose my personality or my background. You know, I just want to make sure that I feel confident and I feel good when I speak. So people uh, understand that when I'm confident and two, they can really understand what I'm speaking about. And the classes to me really helped in that sense, because I learned how to communicate in a way that one, they would understand and two, I would again, feel confident, but it's troubling at the same time, because if, if you think about it, it's like, okay, like, do I want to sound like someone that I am not, you know, it's, it's confusing. It's definitely, it's definitely a little weird if you think about it with, uh, with time. Koji, it's been seven years or thereabouts since you arrived in the U.S., what can people who are in a similar situation to what you are when you did arrive do to fast track their success in the US, particularly in tech? What's important for them to focus on and what have you learned through your own experience that isn't? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard because I feel time. There's nothing that really replaces time, right? Like, there are things that you really need to have the time to sit down and just people have different times. My feeling is that I try to be adaptable. I try to like learn fast and be keep in mind that people have their best intentions, but sometimes either they unconsciously do something that is not ideal or sometimes they just don't know how to act. So I try to keep you know, myself always positive, always try to assume best intents and just adapt fast. Um, I don't think there is a something that I would say like to anyone to expedite that. I think it's just like make sure that you're always open minded and make sure that, yes, you acknowledge the other side, right? Like they also have to get better in this. Like people who are from the country or immigrating, they have to understand that the world now is global, but you can't change everyone's mind overnight. So it's easier to change yourself, but keep, you know, people aware of the things and the biases and keep that in check. So even once you maybe adapt better, you still kind of talk about that. And that's what I'm trying to do too. It's just like, okay, now that I have more space, here's how I feel, because maybe in the past, I didn't have a chance to talk about this. Such an important message, Koji. Thank you. What a great conversation we've had. It's certainly been a brave one. We've covered a lot of ground, and I have no doubt that we've given our listeners today a lot to think about. I want to say thank you for so generously sharing your stories, your per the personal nature of those stories, and your insights with me today. Thank you, Brandon. I love the conversation. I really appreciate the time and everybody who are listening to us now. Thank you. You're most welcome. Koji, if people want to find out more about you, about Cells and Pixels and all the other great things that you're up to, what's the best way for them to do that? All right. So I would say you can look up for Cells and Pixels on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts or you can go to cellsandpixels.com. Um, I had many conversations there with people that I really admire, like Joe Maeda. And I actually started doing this weekly and it was really exhausting, but it was really fun. 
Um, and now I'm doing once a month. So if you subscribe to the channel, you're going to see some updates every month. And also, I would like to share my Twitter handle, which is Koji, E-U-M-E-S-M-O on Twitter. So if you want to follow me, just talk or DM me, I'll be there. Great. Thanks, Koji. And to everyone that's tuned in, it's been great having you here too. Everything we've covered, including where you can find Koji, Sales and Pixels, and all the great things Koji's been up to will be mentioned in the show notes on YouTube. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX, design, and product management, don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe to the podcast. If you want to reach out to me, you can find a link to my LinkedIn profile also in the show notes on YouTube, or you can head on over to thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time, keep being brave.